So I'm going to be talking about the three-body model of cislunar space. So cislunar space is about, it's over a thousand times increase in volume, if you think of it, in, compared to the radius of geo. And of course, we've got the, um, we've got the moon orbiting the Earth, and so a lot of trajectories will look familiar if we were to look in an inertial frame, but we often, especially for many trajectories we care about, they're best viewed in a rotating frame. So this is just showing in a rotating frame, the Earth and the moon are fixed along the, the x-axis, and it's the Earth-Moon line that defines this rotating frame x-axis. The, um, the xy plane is the moon's orbital plane, plus there's five equilibria. That's one of the key things, is these Lagrange points that are in the Earth-Moon system. And so in addition to the Earth and Moon, a spacecraft can actually go into orbit around one of these Lagrange points. So that's one of the interesting features. I'll be talking about some of those types of orbits, but also mean motion resonance. So this is an example transfer that is, let's say, an, an ex-geo transfer. It starts at a radius of, of geo. This is all just planar, so it's in the moon's orbital plane, starting out at a radius of geo. And then this is in the inertial frame on the left and the rotating frame on, on the right. And one of the reasons we like viewing things in the the lunar rotating frame. So this multi-petaled shape represents that this is a resonance. And when things align just right, the spacecraft is now near L1. It goes through, it goes past L1 and gets onto an orbit around the moon. This has a perilune of, I think, 14,000 kilometers. Um, after leaving GEO, so 90, over 90% 90 of the delta V was leaving GEO. And then there were two other maneuvers here that took less than 10% uh, of the, the remainder to get onto a stable orbit around the moon. And this would be quite a bit cheaper than the direct home and transfers that the Apollo missions used, but you pay for that in additional time. But this would be kind of an example of a, a, a low energy transfer that just uses the Earth moon system. But as has been mentioned, the sun can't be ignored. So this is another trajectory very similar to the Hiten mission from the early 90s, where um, the trajectory goes out much further than the orbit of the moon and under the perturbation of the sun kind of gets brought back um, naturally. There, there's, there's only one delta V and it's, it's here. So everything else here was a ballistic capture. So this takes advantage of the chaotic dynamics and the, definitely the, the, the multi-body dynamics. So this would be a solution to the four-body problem but the building blocks are three-body systems. So we've got two three-body systems here. Earth, moon, spacecraft, and then sun Earth spacecraft. And they fortuitously are kind of energetically connected. And so there's, it's pretty easy to go from one of the Lagrange points of the Earth moon system, so a lunar Lagrange point, to one of the Earth Lagrange points. All right, so I'm going to be just trying to introduce some of the basic concepts of the three body problem. So I'll go through the equations of motion and that there is an important conservation of energy. It's not necessarily total energy. It's something that you, you really only see when you view things in the rotating frame. And it's related to this Tisserand parameter, something called the Jacobi constant. And it puts a constraint on the motion. And then there's the Lagrange points and then motion around them. You can linearize around these points. First of all, how do you find them? And then linearize the motion around them. And there's different types of periodic and quasi-periodic <laughs> orbits. Uh, there's also larger scale motions, especially related to L4 and L5. They're called tadpole and horseshoe orbits. And then around uh, L1 and L2, and also L3, there can be Lyapunov and, and Halo orbits, which have gotten a lot of you know, press recently. And I think they look like kidney beans and potato chips. So just to get us all ready for lunch, right, let's, uh, let's talk about food. I'll do a little MATLAB demo about uh, finding in the idealized model, finding an initial condition that's on a Halo orbit and all the tools that we use for that. And then a little bit about mean motion resonances and just sort of ending maybe talking about cislunar space and beyond, how it's connected to trajectories in the sun-earth-moon system. All right, so this circular restricted three-body problem, the reason it's called restricted is because you're looking at a spacecraft or idealized as a point, a point P in the field of two massive bodies, M1 and M2, that are both in orbit about their Berry center and in the simplest approximation, we assume that they're on a circular orbit. I know that the Earth and, and Moon have an eccentricity, but a lot of the phenomena in this simplified model carry over. 
they're rotating about their common center of mass. And we're thinking of, uh, yeah, the motion of some particle P. Capital X and capital Y, this is the, the inertial frame in the moon's orbital plane. But there's some advantage in looking in a, a rotating frame that rotates with the moon's sidereal period of about 27 days. So we define another frame, this little x, so that's the Earth-Moon line, and then little y, and this defines our rotating frame. Uh, the, the moon's orbital plane is inclined to the ecliptic by a few degrees, five, five degrees. It's definitely inclined to the, the plane of the Earth's equator. So just so you know, there are these, there are these differences that in some realistic model we would want to take in, into account. So everything I'm going to talk about is basically assuming the Earth and, and the moon are on circular orbits about their common center of mass and looking in some coordinates x, y, and z. Z will be defined with respect to the, the moon's orbital plane for the spacecraft. Why do we look in the rotating frame? It simplifies the equation. So if you know anything about solving ODEs, it's always a lot better if you don't have any time-dependent term on the right-hand side. If you go into the rotating frame, you actually remove any time-dependent term, with actually the, the, the phase of, of the moon. So it, it simplifies from the point of view of analysis. We also do rescaling. So instead of writing things in terms of kilometers, we tend to normalize by the, uh, the semi-major axis, or just think of it the, as the Earth-Moon distance. So that becomes our length scale. So one non-dimensional unit is 384,400 kilometers. The time is also scaled by that uh, sidereal period divided by 2 pi. And there is a main non-dimensional parameter that, that drops out when you, when you do this for, for any three-body system, and it's called the, the mass parameter or the mass ratio. So it's the mass of the, the smaller body, in this case the moon, to the sum of the two, which for the Earth-Moon system is about 0 0.01215, so about 1 over 100 which is actually pretty large by solar system standards. You could think of this number mu, this non-dimensional non number, as being something like the Reynolds number, but for three body systems. So when you have higher mu, that means different types of phenomena can occur. So Jupiter is the Sun-Jupiter ratio, that's one over a thousand. This is 10 times bigger than that. So there's been a lot of interesting dynamics that have been observed in the solar system for what asteroids do over long periods of time. And we're interested in, well, with this boost, there's actually, it, it should be more chaotic, and it'll be over a shorter time scale in the Earth-Moon system. So this may be, the spacecraft in the Earth-Moon system may be one of the most interesting objects possible, which may be good news or bad news, depending on, you know, makes things maybe harder to track. That's right, the spacecraft mass is, it, it's, it's just like a test particle moving in the gravity field of these two. And so in this, non-dimensional frame uh, along the x-axis the earth is located at negative mu and the the moon is at one minus mu so it's very close to one the equations of motion for the spacecraft are motion in an effective potential and i'll plot the effective potential here um, this is in the rotating frame but then we also have a, a coriolis force again because we're in a rotating frame and again everything here has been non-dimensionalized Right, so this, this effective potential will end up being important for kind of delineating the regions of motion that are energetically possible. Right. The equations of motion, non-dimensionalized, are six-dimensional and look like this. So in, in second-order form, uh, we've got some terms that are accelerations and, and, and velocities. There's an implied angular velocity equal to one because we're assuming that the moon's angular velocity around the, the Earth in the new coordinates is equal to one. So you can think of there being an omega, omega, but they're both one. And then the right-hand side, these are partial derivatives of that effective potential. If you write it in first order form, so this just means we separate out the velocities, and uh, so x dot is vx, and then how does vx change with, with time? So this is showing our, our six states x, y, z, and the velocities, v, x, v, y, v, z, in the rotating frame. There is a constant of motion. In fact, there's, there's, there's only one. So in the classical two-body problem, there's, there's enough constants of motion to make the problem analytically solvable. Definitely not here. And this is what got um, 
you know, Newton upset about the three-body problem. He couldn't solve it. We still can't solve it, but we have a better idea of what types of behaviors can happen. So the constant of motion, uh, I, I call it E for three-body energy, and it equals one-half the velocity squared in the rotating frame plus the, the, uh, the effect of potential. So it looks like one-half V squared or MV squared. M here is just equal to one. We're not considering the mass of the spacecraft plus this effect of potential. I like writing things in terms of this three-body energy. For historical reasons, there's the Jacobi constant, and this ends up equaling negative one-half of the Jacobi constant. So higher energy <laughs> means lower Jacobi constant. You just have to get used to that because when you look at things related to celestial mechanics, there's a lot of historical inertia behind terms. You just got to live with it. So yeah, the squared velocity with respect to the rotating frame. Another way to view it is that uh, one half of the Jacobi constant is equal to negative of the two-body energy, so that's the spacecraft with respect to the Earth, uh, plus the angular momentum and only the Z component. One half the Jacobi constant equals this expression. This is related to the Tisserand parameter. So I'm writing A, E, and I. These are the orbital elements of the spacecraft with respect to the moon's orbital plane. So an inclination of zero means you're, you're in the moon's orbital plane. So how do we use this? This constrains motion via um, something called the, the Tisserand relation. So before and after a close encounter with, with the moon, you still should have this same value of the Jacobi constant, even if A, E, and I have all changed. So this is giving an example of a spacecraft that's in orbit around the Earth, and then it has a close approach with the moon, and it's on a very different orbit. Well, the, the orbital elements for these um, have to be related. So let's say the orbital elements for this, this first, what looks like an elliptical orbit, are A, E, and, and I. And then after that close encounter, we have A prime, E prime, and I prime. So these two have to equal each other. Often we interpret this by looking at a semi-major axis versus eccentricity plot. And we can look at uh, close encounters as corresponding to kind of jumps along a Tisserand curve. So if we look at this AE plot, so we've got semi-major axis in non-dimensional. So one equals um, the orbit of the moon. And then eccentricity, if we just plot some contours of this Jacobi constant, uh, the dynamics are such that, let's say that, that example from before, we had a initial orbit that had a semi-major axis, let's say, of around 0.8, eccentricity of around 0.4. And if we were to calculate the, the Tisserand parameter, it would be around 2.9, which means after that close encounter, we're going to be somewhere else on this curve. In this particular case, after the close approach, which happens over a relatively short amount of time, right, you get um, within the sphere of influence of, of the moon, now you've got a, a different semi-major axis and eccentricity um, and inclination. So that's what, that's what these lines that uh, Aaron was showing before are re related to. In fact, I'm showing that again. So these are the cataloged ex-geospace objects in that frame. Uh, semi-major axis and eccentricity. Also showing these in light gray, the widths of uh, mean motion resonances, but then we also show contours of the Jacobi constant. So this would mean something that's in this regime, like maybe this uh, spacecraft here, after some close encounter, it could be anywhere along this 2.75 contour. Another constraint that we get from energy is just uh, kind of being bound to the Earth where you can't leave, being bound around the moon where you can't leave, and so on. So we call these realms of possible motion, and they're given by, think of these as, it's determined by the initial condition. From whatever initial condition, you calculate that three-body energy, and um, the regions that are accessible, if we were to just look at the, the moon's orbital plane, so I'm showing on, on the right, this is the effective potential, and we're just taking slices of constant energy. And what that corresponds to, these, these curves, for each value of the energy, these are the zero velocity curves. They form boundaries that cannot be crossed for that given um, uh, energy. So sometimes there's three realms, um, and sometimes, uh, or three distinct ones, and then they seem to merge in, into one. 
So let me just show the effect of potential again. And for very low values of energy, so this means things that are kind of deep within the well, the gravity well of either the Earth or the Moon, we're in what we call case one. And this just means energies below the energy of the first Lagrange point. And we, can, we, we label these different regions that are disconnected. There's the exterior region, so the particles outside the orbit of, of the moon. It can actually never get any closer than the, the outer boundary of this, this gray um, shape. We've got the region around the Earth. If you were to start in here at, at this energy, without any additional input, you'd just be bound around the, uh, the, the Earth. There's no possibility of a trajectory getting near the moon. And then there's, of course, the, the realm around the moon. So if you started here, then you'd be, in some sense, trapped around the moon according to energy. Now, the Jacobi constant can change slightly with, with time. We're making the assumption that this is the, just the circular problem, um, and we've got point masses. Again, it's still pretty helpful. So this is for the lowest value of energy. The next significant thing that happens is when we have an energy above that of L1, there's this kind of gateway that opens up. So trajectories that have this energy energetically can go from being in orbit around the Earth to orbit around the Moon and vice versa. Just because they energetically can do it doesn't mean that they can. There's other things going on in the phase space. Uh, as we increase energy more, a gateway opens up around the lunar L2. So that means the trajectory can go between all three realms. If we increase even higher, now we've got an energy higher than uh, L3 but lower than the two Lagrange points, L4 and L5. And for an energy above the, those triangular Lagrange points, there, there is no constraint. So the motion can be anywhere according to this energy criterion. Again, there could be something else going on, and I'll, I'll talk about that, that does bound the types of motions. All right. So these cases, we tend to focus on case two and case three because that's related to where um, Lagrange point orbits around L1 and L2 are. Um, I was just showing kind of a slice through the lunar orbital plane, but of course these are, these are surfaces. So we have two-dimensional surfaces in, in 3D. So instead of a zero-velocity curve, these are zero-velocity surfaces. I'm just showing a, a cutaway. And what trajectories look like they're doing. If they, so if there's no change in energy, you could have um, a trajectory that's around the Earth, and then it's around the Moon. Maybe it, um, can go into the exterior region. But um, as long as you're at one energy, you just have one of these kind of bounding surfaces. And you have to be on the side where there's kinetic energy is positive. Everything else would, if you were to calculate, it has a negative kinetic energy. So it's just not possible. All right. So let's look at these, uh, these neck regions, these bottleneck regions. Um, they're related to the Lagrange points in particular the L1 and L2 and L3, there's a, the, the Hill sphere is roughly the, you know, the definition of the sphere of influence around the moon. And it's basically the, with a radius of 60,000 kilometers, uh, it touches both L1 and L2, roughly. There's some details, but it's pretty close. And these, these points, the, the Grange points, if you remember that surface of the effect of potential I showed before, they're all critical points. They are the five critical points of this effect of potential energy. Yeah, this is L L1 through L5. I'll first talk about the stable points, which are L4 and L5. Then we'll talk about L1, L2, and L3. So L4 and L5 are called the triangular points because they form a the Earth, Moon, and the point form a equilateral triangle. So these are points exactly 60 degrees ahead of and behind um, the moon in its orbit. And they are stable, meaning if you start with the spacecraft a little bit perturbed from this equilibrium point, it'll stay around there. And remember, these are equilibria, but only in the rotating frame. If you, were to view, if you put something at L5 and then looked at it in the inertial frame, um, it would look like it's doing a circular orbit. To get an idea of what the dynamics near L4 and L5 are, we can linearize the equations of motion and shift our origin to be centered at that equilibrium point. And when we do that, so we translate coordinates and keep only linear terms, um, then our six-dimensional system looks like this. We, can, we have methods for analyzing linear systems. 
Um, and one of those is, involves looking at the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues of the dynamics near L4 and L5 all have this uh, form where there's three pairs of imaginary eigenvalues um, and they all have an interpretation. So omega-1 uh, is related to a short period planar motion. Omega-2 with a frequency of 0.3 is a longer period planar oscillation. And then we have a, another pair that corresponds to vertical oscillations. If we just look in the, the, um, the moon's orbital plane, just start there, the, the motion around L4 uh, is epicyclic. So that means you've got motion on you know, cycles upon cycles. In this case, ellipses upon ellipses. And this gives rise to quasi-periodic motion. So if you started a little bit perturbed from, say, L L4, the general type of motion will look something like, like this. Um, the short period motion has a period of one month. So it's this, this small ellipse. You go around this small ellipse once every month. And then that's superimposed on a longer period motion with a period of three months, so going along the larger ellipse. For the value of the, the, the moon's uh, mass parameter, this small ellipse has a ratio of two to one. The larger ellipse has a ratio of, I think, five to one. And if I were to show you an example trajectory, uh, kind of starting near, near L4, this is what the epicyclic motion gives rise to when you're, when you're close to L4. And then if, if you're wondering, well, what if I had some non-zero Z component, then you would just have some vertical uh, oscillations superimposed on this. But uh, objects could collect at the L4 and L5. So this is showing the Sun, Jupiter, L4 and L5 at their famous Trojan asteroid population. But something similar could be happening in the Earth moon. Um, I'm not sure. There may have been some quasi moons detected near L4 and L5 at some point. Earth Sun. Earth Sun, yeah. yeah. Not for this yet. And so for a while, there was interest in putting an object at L the Earth moon L4 and L5 because it is stable. The problem is it's, it takes too much delta V to get there. It's actually a lot easier to get to L1 or L2. And if you use station keeping, it doesn't really matter that those points are unstable. So I think. Um, there still may be some interest in the Earth, Moon, L4, and L5. So let me show you some larger scale motion. If you were to take a uh, trajectory of a higher energy that starts near L4, this is what it does. It still looks epicyclic. And it looks like a tadpole. So these have historically been called tadpole orbits. And if you, if you uh, take a, a larger energy, these tadpole orbits can actually go all the way around to the other side and they form horseshoe orbits. So here's a horseshoe orbit where you can see the epicyclic motion. If we change the initial conditions, you can get something that's even smoother and looks like a horseshoe. So these types of orbits actually happen. Um, this is an, a little video that shows what the spacecraft does. The spacecraft is the white dot, and it's interacting with the moon, which is in green. So you can see what this looks like, both in the rotating frame and the inertial frame. It looks like it's sort of exchanging, right? It goes between an outer orbit and an inner orbit. I, I, don't, I don't actually know what the period of a, horseshoe, a typical horseshoe orbit is in the Earth-Moon system. That would be good, I guess, to know. There was a comet called Oterma that from 1910 to 1980, it did this interesting little dance with Jupiter where it starts outside the orbit of Jupiter and then it passes by Jupiter, and now it's inside the orbit. But it's in a resonant orbit, meaning it's going to catch back up, and then it goes outside again. And if we were to calculate what the semi major axis is, this is non-dimensional, so this is A divided by A of Jupiter. The semi major axis up until the close encounter, and then it kind of goes, it doesn't really make any sense uh, during the encounter. And then when it's inside the orbit of Jupiter, what does it do? And then it has another close encounter and it's outside again. This is only to show that you wouldn't just depend on orbital elements, heliocentric orbital elements to describe this, this object. And in fact, we look at this in terms of if you project the motion of the comet into the rotating frame of Sun and Jupiter, it actually reveals something that wasn't otherwise there. This green trajectory is some kind of theoretical trajectory that um, the Oterma trajectory is kind of near and helps us understand 
this idea of resonance transition. This transitions from resonance outside of Jupiter's orbit to inside Jupiter's orbit by passing through you know, one of these, these L1 and L2 bottlenecks near Jupiter. And it, it's one of the most chaotic objects in, in the solar system. So Shoemaker-Levy 9, the comet that collided with Jupiter in 1994, was also on, on one of these types of trajectories. So it's thought that these types of objects, um, they probably won't last long. They're going to crash into Jupiter, or they're going to get ejected from the system or something. They're, they have not, uh, they're not going to stick around for another 5 billion years. So now let's talk about those, the other points, the ones that are unstable. They're called the collinear points because they're along the Earth-Moon line. They're unstable. Again, if I show this effective potential, if I were to say take a slice through this effective potential energy surface, then you can see that you know, L3, L1, and L, L2 are all at, um, they're actually at critical points, saddle points of the uh, effective potential. In this slice, they just look like peaks. So you can calculate where L1, L2, and L3 are exactly. Uh, one way to do that is using a, a polynomial. So the location of L1 and L2 with respect to the moon, you could write those distances as gamma 1 and gamma 2, respectively, and their solution is given by a fifth order polynomial. And these are, this, these are the non-dimensional distances. So the, the upper sign is for uh, gamma 1, the lower sign is for gamma 2. You could write these in terms of an approximate solution where this leading order term RH is the, the hill radius. So the hill radius in non-dimensional units is uh, 0.1594. In um, dimensional units, it's around 60,000 kilometers. So it's, it's about the um, size of the sphere of influence of the moon. And you'll see there's a minus and, and a plus here. So L1 is always a little bit closer to the moon than L2. We could do the same thing that we did looking at L4 and L5 where we linearize the dynamics and um, kind of see what types of motions are possible. So when we, again, translate the coordinates to being centered at L1 or L2 and then keep only linear terms, we've got um, dynamics looks like this. The eigenvalues are different. So we have a different type of spectrum than we did for L4 and L5. In particular, we have this real pair. So we have one real pair and two imaginary pairs. How do we interpret this? The real pair corresponds to stable and unstable motion. So approaching or departing L1 or L2. Uh, this imaginary pair, plus or minus i omega p, these are planar oscillations. Plus or minus i omega v are uh, vertical oscillations. And we have four different types of trajectories that you can combine with those uh, types of motions. So looking at, let's just say, let's look at the Earth-Moon L2. What types of motions can happen? So this is for that case three where we've got these kind of bottlenecks. I'm showing the zero velocity curve. Just sort of zooming in on the zero velocity curves around L2. We've got bound orbits. So that corresponds to the, all the orbits, periodic and quasi-periodic, that kind of stick around L, L2 and do not depart or approach the point. Then there's um, what are called, I label them as A. These are asymptotic trajectories. They're asymptotic to the bound orbits, and they come in two types. There's the ones that are stable, so they're winding on to one of these periodic or quasi-periodic orbits, or you could be winding off of it, which would be an unstable. Uh, these things labeled T are transit orbits, so they these are the all of the trajectories that go from one side of, say, this L2 bottleneck to the other, and vice versa. And then there are others that are non-transit, so they sort of approach L2, and then they sort of get bounced back to their realm of origin. So we're, we'll consider the bound orbits first, and then uh, transit orbits. So if we look at the, uh, if, we, if we only look at the, uh, the components that have oscillations, then the solutions near L1 and L2 all look like this. So this is giving x, y, and z explicitly as a function of time. And it's, it, it's quasi-periodic motion because we have two frequencies. We've got omega p, the planar, and then uh, omega v. These amplitudes, ax and az, they, are, they correspond to in-plane and out-of-plane um, amplitudes. So this would be 
Remember, we've got the, the origin here would be L1 or L, L2. AX would be the X amplitude. The Y amplitude is just given by a, a constant, kappa, um, that comes from some terms that you get from the linearization. It's kappa times AX. So you don't get to independently change that. But you can independently choose the, the, the Z amplitude. And so this is showing three different projections, the XY, XZ, and YZ. If you look at them all together in X, Y, and Z, I think this looks like the, the edge of a muffler. So um, not appetizing necessarily, but you get the idea. Things are, we've got mufflers. Eventually we'll get to potato chips. Um, these are, this is a family of planar orbits. They're called the Lyapunov orbits. Um, and they, they look like kidney beans. So I'm gonna call them kidney beans. So this is showing you've got very small orbits around L1 and then these large ones that you see that they sort of, uh, they bend around the moon and go back out. And then you sort, you look, it looks a little bit like a mirror image for the L2 family. The small amplitude orbits uh, around L1 and L2, they have periods of around half a uh, sidereal month, so around 14 days. As you go to larger orbits, so larger amplitude, the period does increase. If the frequencies are, are equal, and so this, this, is only, this can only happen due to nonlinear effects. If frequencies are equal, then you could have a halo periodic orbit. So that means you've got uh, something sealing, closing back up both in the horizontal and vertical, rather than that Lisa Jew's kind of muffler shape. So it happens when there's, there's nonlinear contributions. And so this is showing a, a halo orbit um, viewed from the top, viewed from the side. So the, the uh, z equals zero is the, the lunar orbital plane. And then this is the view from Earth, the view from Earth roughly. And this is why things are called halos. It's like it seems to form a halo around the moon or the point. And these have periods of uh, from 7 to 14 days because you, uh, the, the NRHO um, nearly rectilinear halo orbits, I think they're closer to 7 days. And if you were to look at this in three-dimensional space, it looks like the edge of a potato chip. It's got curvature. They come in two different varieties, so there's the, the northern and southern, northern just means they have a, a Z amplitude that takes them, they spend most of their time above the uh, orbital plane. Uh, southern spend most of their time below the orbital plane, but of course they do poke through. Now ha halo orbits, all you have to do is specify their Z amplitude because AX is coupled to AZ. I won't give the formula, but you can define these in terms of just the, uh, the Z amplitude. And this is showing a an entire family of halo orbits. So at each three body energy value, there is one halo orbit. So this is showing the family of uh, many different uh, halo orbits of different energies. And we're, we're ending here with this nearly rectilinear halo orbit. So similar to what capstone's using. In fact, this may be the capstone orbit. So we would call this the L2 halo orbit family. And I think this is only the northern family. There'd be some kind of mirror image southern family if that was of interest. And how do we calculate these? Well, we need to use some techniques from dynamical systems theory to calculate them and their stability, which is useful um, because then you could calculate the whole set of trajectories that actually winds onto these. That gets back to those asymptotic orbits. Just to give you a view of what this, the nearly rectilinear halo orbit looks like in an Earth-centered inertial frame doesn't really make much sense here. If you look in the Earth, mean, Earth Moon rotating frame, well, things are making more sense. Even if you looked in a moon centered inertial frame, you would see what looks like some kind of processing, twisting ellipse. And this is why we like using the Earth Moon rotating frame. It reveals structure that you sometimes cannot really even tell looking in the good old familiar inertial frame. All right. Um, and for an orbit like this, you do need some small station keeping maneuvers since the orbit is unstable. And usually uh, you could do these just once per orbit and they're pretty low. 
what is this? So this, so this just shows something that uh, after you've studied a three-body problem, you realize that like a great work of art or a great book, it is inexhaustible. There, there's more dynamics and there's more information than you can possibly articulate just because it's got, it's got structure at many different scales. What this is revealing, this is uh, some work by some applied mathematicians who were looking at families of periodic orbits in the Earth-Moon system. So here, the moons over here, we've got L1, L2, and then L3. I'll just show you some of these orbits. So this is a family of halo orbits around L3. Um, some other strange type of orbits, again, periodic, around uh, L3. I think A for, uh, stands for axial orbits. Uh, there's orbits around L4, and if you look at these, they're, they, look, um, they don't look exactly like horseshoes, but all of these are definitely closing back up, and there, there's entire families of them. The families connect, and you get different branches connecting. This, I think W just stands for weird. These are weird orbits, they're periodic. They kind of go between uh, L1 and then L4. There's this whole family of orbits. Uh, vertical orbits, these are vertical orbits near L1 and you know, all of these families could be followed and maybe of some use for, for cislunar missions. Very few have even been considered, but they exist, yeah. Is it possible to just chill on Oberon point? Like, from a certain perspective, almost seems stationary to the moon or else? Well, since, because of the, the moon's eccentricity, there is no exact point that corresponds to L1. When you look at the, the, uh, the effect of eccentricity, the L1 point gets replaced by an L1 periodic orbit. That's like its dynamical equivalent. But most of the things that we're talking about here will carry over to the full system, but you, yeah, you can't technically stay at, at, at L1. It's, it's moving, plus uh, in terms of comms, if you were at L1, um, maybe the moon would be interfering because it's in, in the way, but yeah. L3 is kind of mysterious and nobody really considers it um, because it's you know, exactly opposite the moon, but might be good for some missions. All right, so we've talked about the equations of motion and some things about the Lagrange points. I'm gonna now go into more about the stability of trajectories, especially uh, periodic orbits, and then I think we'll get to the, the MATLAB demo. Uh, so back to those equations of motion for the CR3BP, circular restricted three body problem. If, uh, if we write these in first order form, like I showed before, then well, this is just to say we can. We have a six-dimensional state vector, all right? If we have a reference trajectory, so let's just say we started with some initial condition x naught, integrated it uh, for some amount of time. We've got a reference trajectory. We want to know what, is, what are the dynamics like for nearby trajectories? And there's a procedure for that. Um, it's called the, the variational equations. So the variational equations show how a... Um, initial perturbation, let's just call it delta x naught, that corresponds to some nearby state, and then how does that evolve in time? So here's that nearby trajectory and where it ends, and we would call at the end of this time, this is the, the perturbation vector. How much did the perturbation vector increase or decrease or change direction? And so to calculate that, um, we calculate these variational equations. The, um, they're just written by taking that, the vector field, the six ODEs, and differentiating it. You get some matrix A that uh, depends on time. And for, for the three body problem, it has a nice structure where uh, this is a, a six by six matrix. I3 just means the three by three identity. And then the others have a, uh, some simple representation. I won't, I won't go through it. Um, I guess the main thing is this matrix U is made up of second derivatives of the effective potential. And everything is evaluated along the reference solution. Now one nice way to write what the result is of these, these variations is to use what's called the state transition matrix. So we can write what's the, the perturbation at a time t is this uh, object phi. It's a six by six matrix multiplying the initial perturbation. So the, the state transition matrix reflects the sensitivity of the state um, 
at the initial time, or it reflects sensitivity of the state at the final time to perturbations of the state at the initial time. And how do we use this? Well, let's just, we, we can calculate it. So here's the ODE for the state transition matrix. This object is six by six, so it's 36 variables. So you've got 36 variables. Um, if I were to summarize it, we've got our equations of motion, which are just six dimensions, so six variables, and then the variational equations taking care of this. Another 36. The initial conditions are some initial point, so some initial point on a reference orbit you care about, and then the initial uh, state transition matrix is just the identity matrix. So this is a initial value problem, and you can just propagate it for, for any trajectory you want. It ends up being 42 ODEs. Um, now, you know, think of a, a, a halo orbit. A halo orbit is, is periodic. So if we were to kind of view what it looks like in the state space, it comes back to itself. That's what this dark blue trajectory is. It forms a closed loop of some period T. And we want to know what do initial deflections away from the, if we're not exactly on this periodic orbit, maybe we want to find a periodic orbit. If we, uh, if we think there is one, um, we can look along uh, a, a transverse slice of the phase space called a, a Poincaré section. And if you look at what's going on in that Poincaré section, here's some initial state. And what if we had a perturbation? So this is a, an initial state that's on the periodic orbit. What if we're not on the periodic orbit? So we've got some small perturbation. After one period, will pierce this surface again at a different location. So this is delta X capital T, meaning after one period T. And it equals some matrix M times the, this initial uh, vector displacement. The matrix M is called the monodromy matrix. You obtain that from s simulating, uh, taking as your, your reference trajectory a periodic orbit and then calculating the state transition matrix over one period. So it, it, it contains all of the information about the linearized dynamics near a periodic orbit. There we go. This is just an animation that shows you, here's a periodic orbit, and we're piercing it with a Poincaré section. What if we had something that wasn't exactly on a periodic orbit? What's it going to do? Well, it might kind of oscillate around. And so each of these, line, each of these dots corresponds to a different perturbation away from the, the periodic orbit. If we were now restrict ourselves to looking at a halo orbit, what will we get? Well, the, the eigenspectrum uh, will be put on this, this complex plane. So we've got real and imaginary, and I'm showing the unit circle. If there's an eigenvalue inside the unit circle that corresponds to stable um, dynamics, so there's a corresponding eigenvector or direction with stable dynamics. If it's outside, that means it's unstable, and if it's on the unit circle, that means it's leading to dynamics that isn't exponentially growing or shrinking. It's just sort of hanging around. So those would be where, uh, I guess, bound orbits near the halo orbit, which are then called quasi-halo orbits. But let's just go through this. So for a halo orbit um, around either L1 or L L2, we have a first pair of eigenvalues. Um, that due to a constraint of Hamiltonian systems, their product has to equal one. And one of them is usually pretty large, uh, on the order of a thousand. <laughs> and so that means it's, it, it defines the most expanding direction, or unstable direction. And the other one is going to be the reciprocal of that, so one over lambda one, because this product thing has to hold true. So it's within the unit circle, so it defines the most contracting direction, or it's used to compute the stable manifold. And this is just showing those kind of corresponding eigenvectors of things winding onto or off of a periodic orbit. Um, I think I'll show a better version of this. Yeah, I think it's good to just sort of show the video. So this is a periodic orbit. And just think of this abstractly in phase space. This green surface is the stable manifold of things winding onto it. This orange surface is the unstable winding, uh, actually winding off. The other one's winding on. And so together, this sort of gives the, the saddle-like dynamics near a halo orbit. So you would be coming in sort of on this, near this green surface, but then you would leave on the orange surface. 
Or if you're exactly on the, the green surface, this corresponds to a free transfer onto your <coughs> halo orbit. And so that's one of the appeals of using an unstable halo orbit is you can target this object called the stable manifold and wind onto the, once you get onto the stable manifold, you don't have to do anything. The natural dynamics will bring you into um, the halo orbit. If it looks like the yellow is, uh, sorry, the green is bringing you in closer. Yes. So what happens once you get past the pink? No, so you, uh, you just sort of slow down and asymptotically approach the pink. Okay. That's what will happen. So see, you keep spiraling and spiraling and then you never quite get to the pink orbit, but effectively you get close enough that if you were to, you wanted to start operations, you'd be close enough. Okay, I got it. So if you're inside the pink, that's the top green that goes completely, you've got state lambda and state lambda inside it. But yeah. Okay. So that's what the, the, uh, the first pair of eigenvalues give you. There's a second pair of eigenvalues. They're each equal to one. One corresponds to perturbations just along the halo orbit. If you perturb infinitesimally along any periodic orbit, you're still on that periodic orbit, just at a different phase. The other one that's, I guess, more interesting is an, the corresponding eigenvectors pointing to nearby halo orbits on nearby energy shells, which means you could perturb in some direction where uh, things won't grow. You're just on a nearby orbit. Because all these halo orbits, you, you saw before that interesting animation showing the whole family. So one of the other eigenvectors is just pointing to, if you were to perturb in that direction, you're just on another halo orbit of a slightly different period. The, I guess, last pair, um, lambda 5 and lambda 6, these are two complex conjugate eigenvalues of modulus 1. So if we were to kind of summarize where all of our eigenvalues are, we've got some eigenvalues, we've got two eigenvalues at one, we've got one inside the unit circle, one outside, and now two that are on the unit circle. And the, the dynamics that correspond to these um, is, uh, is quasi-halo orbits. So these are orbits that are not exactly periodic, but they form what looks like a tube around the halo orbit and they wind around it. Uh, if I were to show, this is an animation from some work uh, we did at JPL around 20 years ago of a formation um, of five spacecraft kind of near a halo orbit, and they're all trying to stay in the, in the same plane. And they're using, their, their dynamics making them go around the, the halo orbit are just because they're actually on nearby quasi-halo orbits. So a halo orbit uh, is sometimes called a center saddle type. Saddle meaning things can approach and depart. Think of raindrops on a saddle. And then the center means this quasi-periodic motion. How do we compute these, these stable manifolds, that, that green surface from that earlier animation? Well, we need to find the stable eigenvector at some initial point x naught along the, the orbit. So, um, if we take some point along the halo orbit, there is a, uh, a stable eigenvector direction. And let's say we've normalized that to be one. And then we take a very small infinitesimal perturbation, epsilon, in that, in that direction, and follow it um, backward in time. And you do that for a bunch of points along the periodic orbit. You can construct this, sort of, this highway of trajectories that are winding onto that periodic orbit. And that's the, the code that I'll, I'll show you actually does that. So you can play with it and do some things. This epsilon, just a rule of thumb, seems to be that using plus or minus 10 to the negative 6 is good. And each of these stable manifolds, there's two branches. So there's one going one way and one going the other. We'll, we'll see that. All right. So this is showing a halo orbit and locally in green, you can see that these are individual trajectories. You can see that they're kind of like woven fibers. It is kind of hard to see. They're winding on to the periodic orbit. The red, these are unst on the unstable manifold on the other side, winding off of it. So if you wanted to depart a halo orbit, you would just do some small perturbation in one, one of these unstable directions, and then you'd be following one of these red trajectories. That if you look at the continuum of them, they form a tube. So there's a lot of tubes going around. 
this is another view. Um, so here's the, the Earth, the Moon. If we were targeting some Sun-Earth L2 halo orbit, uh, we'll show a surface of all of the trajectories that will wind onto that. And we call that a superhighway. And so if that comes near some parking orbit near the Earth, then you could just get onto that, and then you will, you will asymptotically approach the halo orbit that you want. So this would be, what is this, Sun-Earth L2? So this is where James Webb is. Yes, they are, they, they are slow. It's not, it's not a super highway. It is by astronomical uh, reasoning, I guess. So that's what the surface of these stable and unstable manifolds of periodic orbits can lead to. But if you're inside, not on the surface, but inside, these things are called tubes. So work that goes back to a couple of ma mathematicians who got involved in celestial mechanics in the late 1960s, Conley and McGehee, uh, kind of discovered these locally before we had widespread use of computers. And now that we've got computers, we can calculate these things and use them for low energy transfers. So the idea would be, let's say here we've got a L2, think of this as either a halo orbit, a Lyapunov orbit, doesn't, doesn't quite matter. What we're showing is the stable manifold shown in blue going out here. So if we had our spacecraft somewhere out here and we wanted it to get captured by the moon, we just need to make sure we're inside this tube, not on it. If we were on it, we would wind onto this periodic orbit. But if we're inside of it, we'll actually pass by L2 and then maybe get onto some ballistic capture orbit around the moon. This is an animation that shows kind of what things look like in the th in the energy surface, you've got tubes. We use Poincaré sections to take slices of these tubes. A transit trajectory would be going from one side to the other of this periodic orbit. Non-transit kind of comes near that periodic orbit and bounces back. So the projection down onto position space is shown at the bottom here. This is for a, a different system, not exactly the Earth-Moon system, but hopefully you get the idea. So we can use Poincaré sections and look at intersections of multiple tubes, and if you, if you connect these in just the right way, you can design some interesting trajectories. Uh, I just want to show, this is, a, this is a simulation showing in red trajectories that are bound to the Earth and blue bound to the Moon, and you see kind of how intermingled everything can be here. And when I say bound, I don't mean for all time. I just mean for some short amount of time, because things could get ejected and everything. If you want to start firing this up, we're going to do the MATLAB demo. I'm going to give the, the background about what the MATLAB code is doing. And then I'll just show you briefly. You could, you could bring it up. I just have one piece of code. It's a, it's a live script. That's what the .mlx means for MATLAB. So what are we doing? What are we going to be computing? We want to, get, uh, we want to compute a halo orbit and its stable manifold. And we're doing this in the idealized model first. If you wanted to transfer it to the real eph ephemeris, I'm not going to be covering that here, but uh, that'd be a whole other course, I think. So we're going to simulate the idealized circular to three-body equations. We need an initial condition for the halo orbit. Um, we can get that from some previous work that was published in the 1980s, where they looked at not just a linear approximation, but nonlinear. Uh, someone named Richardson. So we'll be using what's called the Richardson approximation. If you take that initial guess and propagate it for what should be one period, it actually doesn't come back onto itself. So we need to use a, we start with that as a guess, but then we, we iterate using a process called differential correction. Um, until we're within a, a, a tolerance, meaning the orbit closes up to within whatever we want, a kilometer, meter, centimeter. And then once we've found that, we can, uh, once we've found the periodic orbit, we can compute its stable manifold using the local uh, stable directions and then integrate backwards in the full system of equations. All right? So the, uh, we're going to use some analytic approximations combined with numerical techniques to get an accurate halo orbit. And so this is well suited to what we call differential corrections process. Um, the analytical approximation gives us a first guess, and then we iterate, and we get a halo orbit. All right, so 
we've already seen this before. This is one way to write the solution of the variational equation. So how uh, small departures from some reference trajectory, how they propagate from some initial departure. It's all encoded in this thing called the, the state transition matrix from the initial time, T naught, to some current time, T. And yeah, it reflects the sensitivity. But how do we, how do we use this? All right, so the, something you should know about halo orbits is they have a symmetry because the equations of motion have a symmetry. So this is the view from above, uh, so looking down at the xy plane. And then this is the view from the moon, looking in the yz plane. This is a, a, a already calculated periodic orbit, so it's not the initial guess. Halo orbits are symmetric with respect to that xz plane. So that means the y equals zero plane. So they must intersect uh, y equals zero with no velocity in either x or z, only velocity in y. So for example, if you could see this little um, yellow dot here, we've got an initial state vector that's along this, uh, this y axis. Um, actually, it's not along the y. It has an initial, it's along the x axis. So it has an initial x, an initial z, and an initial y velocity, and then all the other components are zero. Now, if we, how do we get this guess? We get this guess from some third order approximations. And then we integrate the ODEs. I don't know if you saw that, it was pretty cool. We integrate the ODEs till they cross this XZ plane again. And they, to be a real periodic orbit, they have to cross um, perpendicularly. So for a periodic solution, because of the symmetry of halo orbits, the final state vector has to have this form, where when it hits here, it's got a value of x, z, but no y, y is zero. And then uh, the only velocity component is y. So we could code in that we want to wiggle this initial state vector to get something of a, a final state vector of, of this form. It'll basically be driving these values of the x velocity and y velo uh, z velocity to zero. We can, we can compute this. Um, we want the change initial change to be determined by the difference between a desired final state and the actual final state. So that's our uh, final perturbation vector. And these are some details that you could look up more. Um, I've got them in a, a free book. Um, but we, we continue this process until the, the final x velocity and z velocity is, it's not quite zero, but it's some small enough tolerance. So sometimes I'll set that to be like 10 to the negative 10, something really small. And usually convergence is achieved within four iterations of this approach. Um, so now I can do the MATLAB demo. So here's the main program. There's differential corrections for halo orbits. And I'm not very good at writing MATLAB code. So I use global variables that probably I shouldn't, but you know, this is, this is legacy uh, software, let's say. So you get to set the mu value. In this case, I've chosen a mu for the Earth-Moon system. And you can pick what Lagrange point you want to calculate the periodic orbit for. So I'm saying, well, let's do Lagrange point one. And then uh, you're picking the a z amplitude for your initial guess for the halo orbit and it's something really small here it's just point two because this is in units of the moon to l1 distance which is about fifty eight thousand kilometers so point two is going to be about twelve thousand kilometers and then you can pick do i want a northern or a southern halo remember those are the ones that are kind of they're bent like this or they're bent like that we get our initial guess from this thing called uh, the third order Richard, Richardson analytical guess. And we make a guess for what the final time will be, which is way too large. Two pi is way too large. And then this integrates and we plot. So from that initial guess, this green star here is where L1 is. This is the moon, this is the moon orbit, but this is all viewed in the rotating frame. So we started at this uh, red circle and this did not go back onto itself. It did some weird excursion around the moon. 
But all I really care about is that it actually came back and hit the x-axis or xz plane. As long as I have that, then I could use differential correction and fix it. So this differential correction is in here. You can set different cases. This says halo get. And this took five attempts for it to um, correct down to this level. So this was our this is our final initial condition. And you notice it comes back and it seems to hit perpendicularly over here. And I'm just doing the XZ projection so it's easier to see. So this, if I integrate it for one entire period, um, it's a it's a periodic orbit. This is you can see it in a 3D view here. Let's see, can I can I mess around with this view? I don't know if it's gonna let me. No, maybe not. This is showing the eigenvalues for this. Um it says I don't trust this. I don't know what this is giving. Let's hope that behind the scenes it's actually calculating the, the correct values. I guess I could run this, right? I could run if I can get all these obnoxious things out of the way. Okay. So now it's running in real time. It tells me what the period is of the periodic orbit in terms of these non-dimensional units. It's plotting the periodic orbit. The frame rate on here is pretty bad. All right. Now we're just plotting different views of this halo orbit that we just made. And if we wanted to get the stable manifold, this is some code that does that for us. This is one trajectory on the stable manifold, meaning if we started here, this middle right, we'll follow forward. It looks like it goes around the moon, and then it just winds around, and we'll end up on that halo orbit. If we want to look, um, this just adds tick marks, like one day tick marks, so you can kind of see how quickly things are traveling. If we wanted to show several trajectories on the stable manifold, we just take different points along that periodic orbit and do the same kind of integrate backwards along the stable manifold, and we get this horrendous looking thing. If I can bring it out. And can I rotate it? So you can kind of see the halo orbit is somewhere over here. The moon's there. The moon seems to be getting in the way of what should look like a tube. So if this tube intersects the moon, all hell breaks loose. Um, and things just go in all different directions or something's collide with the, with the moon. And I'm still highlighting that red trajectory we showed before. So you could use this for design. Suppose you wanted to find something that gets onto that halo orbit from the moon. Well, one of these is probably getting really close to uh, some orbit around the moon, a low moon orbit. And so this is how people design transfers to things like halo orbits or other things in the three body problem. All right. So that, that's it for the, the MATLAB. You've got the code. You have my permission to use it, but if you do publish something, you know, cite me or um, at least give me a shout out. An initial guess and put it in the real ephemeris because we can go back and forth between these idealized models and the real world. Like we can take a real world object like a comet, see what it looks like in the idealized frame and we get some insights from that. You can go the other way. If I want to find a halo orbit. Um, so here's an, an initial guess. Now I can move it over to the real ephemeris. You can use differential correction algorithms in the real ephemeris and get something as, um, uh, you know, design the trajectory you want. So in the final little bit, I'm going to talk about connections between the cislunar and heliocentric space and then some, something about mean motion resonances. And then, uh, then we'll, we'll basically be done. So this is showing uh, that how cislunar space is dynamically connected to heliocentric space. So if you just sort of zoom in on, here's the, the Earth and the Moon, and 
We've got these Lagrange points. It actually takes a similar amount of energy once you've left the Earth to get from one to the other, and, and they're connected. So there are natural transfers uh, between a lunar L1 halo and a Earth moon, I mean Sun Earth L1 halo. And we can calculate these. This is a, kind of an artist's rendering of what these tubes and dynamics go on the tubes look like. Um, I think this is a good video to show. I'm not sure if it, if it starts. This was from a, a, a project before there was the James Webb Space Telescope. We thought, well, what if you wanted to repair something out at the, the Sun-Earth L2? So this would be the Sun-Earth L2 halo orbit. And we're getting closer and closer here. We're kind of zooming in on the moon and showing the lunar L1 and the lunar L2 and a couple of halo orbits around them. Suppose we've got some, uh, suppose we've created a new component for a space telescope here at the lunar L1 orbit, and we want to get it out to the Sun-Earth L2. Uh, well, then we would just kind of push it off, just give it a little nudge in the direction of this unstable manifold. Um, and we only show that until it intersects the moon's orbit. It does continue and get tangly and spaghetti-like. But if you do it right so that it now goes past L2, so you kind of get into that L2 uh, regime and, go, and get past that, um, the L2 unstable manifold intersects this Earth halo stable manifold. So you could have something that now is resident there. And if you wanted to bring it back, again, you could, you could do something similar where you would perturb this along this orbit's unstable manifold and, and bring it back, maybe for repair or um, maybe this was a sample return mission. I don't know. You have to, you have to time it. You have to time it correctly, yeah. So now, now you have to worry about what's the phase, let's say, of either the, the sun in the Earth-Moon frame or of the moon in kind of the sun-Earth frame. And this is, a, this is an, an artist's schematic, so it's not like tubes are stopping and stuff. We're just, this is how we're trying to depict it. What's like a ballpark delta V for doing that? Get out there. Zero. Well, you mean to get to L1, L1 the nudges? The nudges can be arbitrarily small. So this is an example of something that was actually calculated. So this is in the lunar rotating frame. So the Earth-Moon line is here. And then over here, this is the Sun-Earth line. It's the same in initial condition in both of the frames. But if I were to start out here, I can do a delta V. Here I chose you know, 14 meters per second, but it could be smaller. This leaves, and it goes into, you can see the rest of it here. It leaves the vicinity of the moon, and for now zero delta v, it is on a, an L2, Sun-Earth L2 halo orbit. And then if you wanted to, you could bring it back or go to the other side. But that's the nice thing about this chaotic regime, is for very little amount of del delta v, you could transverse a very uh, you know, wide swath of cislunar space. And some things that we didn't um, know we're going to come back have come back. So here's the Saturn V upper stage that came back. This is the uh, Earth, Sun Earth L, L1. So it was in a heliocentric orbit for several decades, came back, does a little dance with the Earth Moon system, and then, and then left. And this, it could do this forever. So it's just a piece of space junk that's occasionally in heliocentric space. Uh, you might call it the sun realm, using my terminology from before. And then it comes back through this L1 gateway because its energy isn't changing much. Its three-body energy is just in this regime where it's going to be orbiting around the Earth and then orbiting around the moon. And maybe it's eventually going to hit the moon or get ejected to the outside. Who knows? All right, so mean motion resonances from the three-body problem point of view. This is just showing a... Hopefully you have an idea of what resonance is. This is just a hypothetical Jupiter and Saturn in a two to one resonance. So Jupiter orbits twice for each one orbit of Saturn. And so when you have situations like this, the, uh, the masses can perturb each other. In our case, we have uh, just, we have the moon, instead of the sun, we have the earth, and then we've got a spacecraft that can be perturbed by uh, having these periodic kind of meetups with the moon or periodic close approaches. 
So resonances between the spacecraft and, and the moon. If you look in an inertial frame, um, I'm showing the Earth and moon. So the moon's in gray. The spacecraft is this black dot. After it does one half of its orbit, the moon has done a quarter of its orbit. So this is in the two to one resonance, just as an example. After one full period of the orbit of the spacecraft, moon is, has only done half an orbit. And notice there isn't a close approach. All throughout, there's no close approach viewing in the inertial frame. If you view it in the rotating frame, so you get an idea of what does this trajectory look like in the rotating frame. And when the, it doesn't have a close approach with the, with the, the moon, right? When it's along that, that line of um, uh, the Earth, Earth moon line, it's actually at its furthest point, so that it's at perigee. So this is a stable resonance. You could have a two to one resonance that's unstable. So just think of the, the spacecraft and the moon now having a close approach um, when we start them out, and they will just periodically have, have a close approach every period of the moon. If you view this in the rotating frame, you can see it. This is a, the, uh, the apogee is actually along the direction of, of the moon. So any small perturbation away from this, and you'll get, um, you'll get unstable motion. So this is an unstable resonance. So all mean motion resonances come in these stable and unstable pairs. And this is just showing a five to one resonance, just so you can get an idea of, you know, it looks like a closed ellipse in the inertial frame, but kind of a multi petaled shape in the rotating frame. We could actually visualize, and this is you know, one of our goals, we want to be able to get a dynamical map of all the possible trajectories, especially uh, at a particular value of energy. So say along a TISRAN parameter, but we'd like to look at all of uh, cis lunar space. Uh, we usually take some location in the rotating frame um, and take a Poincaré section. So a Poincaré section, a global Poincaré section, so not like what I showed before, uh, can give multiple behaviors. So if this point S, after it kind of goes around and then pierces the surface again, now we say it's at PS. So it's been mapped from S to PS under the Poincaré map. Really just under the dynamics of the system, and then we're just viewing it by taking a slice. I think of it as if you have a river and you wanted to know where the fish are, you could kind of do some kind of laser scan and you'll see all the places that the fish are intersecting your, your plane. Here, the fish are uh, cislunar trajectories. <laughs> yeah. This bullseye corresponds to a, in the middle of it would be a periodic orbit, and all of these curves around it would correspond to quasi-periodic orbits that are all stable. And then this region that looks like scattershot is, is chaos. So I'm, I'm going to give an example next of uh, what we see. We tend to see, and we can transform into uh, orbital elements, like angle of periaps, and then this is that non-dimensional semi-major axis. And what you can see here, I call this a Swiss cheese diagram. The holes are, uh, they're actually filled with closed curves, and those are stable resonances. And then there, there is the scattershot region, which is a chaotic sea surrounding these stable islands, stable resonance islands. So this would be a stable um, resonance. In this case, it's the 2, 3 re resonance. Um, and you might think, well, what can we do with this? chaotic regime. If you can start with the right initial condition, um, let's say somewhere within this elliptical region, then if you follow every time the trajectory pierces this surface, it'll be, if it starts out in the chaotic region, it has to stay in the chaotic region. So this keeps on going and it's kind of going between mean motion resonances and schematically what you get is something that can change, in this case it's keeping its apogee the same and changing perigee by close encounters with the moon. So this is that figure that we've seen before of uh, a, a bunch of TLEs for known objects in semi-major axis versus eccentricity. We can actually come up with a model for how things will move along tisserand curves. And that's what this Poincaré section gives in some sense. And they're actually distant flybys. So this is some work um, uh, that we've done looking at 
if you assume, it, it's a bit like the perturbed two-body approach, but we assume that the spacecraft or particles on a near Keplerian orbit around the Earth, and we can write Hamilton's equations. So let me just sort of jump to the, the, the punchline. We use something called Picard's approximation to look at the evolution of the angular momentum. And this gives us some function of uh, the true an anomaly, which at first we thought we want to get this in closed form, but then we actually just left it this way. So this thing delta G, we could relate this to the change in the Keplerian energy over one orbit. And it ends up being of the form, uh, you can bring out mu, that parameter that's 0 0.012, times some function of the argument of perigee that's the, uh, we call that the energy kick function. So this, this is a plot of that energy kick function. Um, we could start interpreting this. So this is, the, this is the perigee angle in the rotating frame. It goes from negative pi to pi. And maybe I'll just jump to the next one, show how this, how this relates. If we have a spacecraft starting here and we just have slightly different initial conditions, we can set this up so that it will have its close approach either right in front of this, this region called omega max or negative omega max right behind the moon. And that will correspond to either a increase in the semi-major axis or a de decrease. So this golden triangle is going to go through and it will be just behind have its close approach. And so that leads to an increase in semi-major axis. Intuitively, you think, I think, okay, in the rotating frame, if I have a close approach to the moon here, that means I'm kind of, I'm slowing down compared to the rotating frame, so I'll get a good tug, a good, a good pull from, from the moon. So that increases the semi-major axis. On the other hand, this blue triangle pointed down will have its close approach right in front of the moon, and that will kind of pull energy out, so its Keplerian energy goes down, you have a decrease in the semi-major axis. And these fates are right next to each other, right? The, this, um, it's hard to see here, but this omega max angle is, is very small. I think it's you know, within five degrees. So there's these sweet spots where you get the biggest effect of a, a close encounter. And these are actually called, they're distant close encounters. They are further than any definition of the sphere of influence for the moon that you want to come up with. Um, but they, it, it, it's a real effect. So what what we have is a, we have an update map where we can update how the orbital elements change after one encounter. And you can imagine after many of these, you could have dramatic changes if you were to you know, find the right trajectory that does this. Again, it's outside the sphere of influence. Um, this is just a, explicitly what our map looks like, and it's got some nice mathematical properties you can read about later. Um, it, this Keplerian map, we can associate it with the Poincaré map so that we can then compare with uh, full numerical simulation. So we've done that. We've um, taken some initial conditions. So this Swiss cheese plot was from taking some initial conditions in the chaotic region and then plotting them in uh, uh, argument of perigee versus semi-major axis for the Keplerian map, which is lightning fast. It's a very fast orbit propagator. If we then compare that with a full numerical integration of the system, you can see structures seem to line up uh, very similarly. So it's a very good approximation. And inside all of these holes, they aren't just holes. These are where there'd be stable um, resonances. In fact, I'll, I'm going to cover what kind of a typical piece of this Poincaré section looks like. We've got things we call resonant zones that are made up, um, they're kind of along the line of an unstable periodic orbit, uh, mean motion resonance, and then inside there's a stable one, and then there are these, these nearby curves uh, correspond to quasi-periodic motion. So if you were to project into the rotating frame, it actually looks like some kind of annulus, something winding around in, in annulus. What I'm showing here, this is a chaotic trajectory. So chaotic trajectories, as you would expect, do chaotic things. <laughs> they can maybe go in orbit from around the Earth and the Moon, vice versa. There's also these bounding, we call this a bounding torus. It's another boundary that is not related to those zero velocity curves. So it's another dynamical constraint on 
um, the motion, especially for chaotic trajectories. Chaotic trajectories can't just do anything. They have to wind around these, uh, these stable things, and sometimes there's an actual edge to where they can go. Just to give you an idea of a resonance zone, so we've got um, stable resonance here, but now I'm showing a dot that corresponds to the unstable resonance. So this, if you were to start an initial condition here, follow it forward for one period, it should come back exactly to that point. These unstable points are trickier to find because there's no uh, kind of target pattern that zeroes in on them. But once you find them, you can get stable and unstable local directions, eigenvectors, and then you could extend those out further. We've already seen this video, so I don't want to show that. Um, but we're, we're going to see some figure that looks like this. So back to here, if we were to, if we integrate these out in the full system, um, forward and backward, this is showing, so green is a stable manifold, red's the unstable manifold. They intersect in, in ways that we can systematically call it the, uh, there is a resonance region. So there's some, you notice there's a chaotic layer to the resonance region. And the overall dynamics is that things kind of come in along stable directions, leave along unstable. And there's just as many things decreasing in semi-major axis as increasing. This is showing two resonance regions that are uh, neighboring each other. And we can, if you want to find trajectories that can really change their semi-major axis a lot for free, you use this effect of kind of navigating between resonance zones. So um, if, if we want to find a trajectory that does something like this, where it, it changes its semi-major axis dramatically, one approach is just you take some line of uh, semi-major axis. I've defined uh, this at some value of A, so this is starting at delta A zero, and I want to get the minimum delta A. So after, after two, uh, periods, this is the curve I get. Um, if I were to zoom in, I'm trying to get the, the smallest delta A possible, so that seems like somewhere around here. I look for 10 more orbits, and somewhere around here, I've got the minimum. I go to now 13 orbits, 25 orbits. What does all, all this mean? Well, I found a point that seems to decrease the semi-major axis the most, and that was after 25 orbits of an initial point Q naught. So this shows, here's Q naught, this is the initial condition in that Poincaré section, here's the final one. And then you see all the intermediate points, there's 25 of them. If you look in an inertial frame, this is showing what the starting orbit looked like, and then the final orbit, 25 orbits later. And so this, this occurs for free, there's no delta V involved in doing this, this transfer from the starting to the final orbit. We just picked an initial condition carefully. And these are naturally connected to uh, ballistic capture. So if you get into one of these kind of little pin shapes, we call this an exit, because you're exiting uh, geocentric space and then entering the region around the moon. Uh, so once you get in there, you get into the region around the moon and you can get captured, ballistically captured. All right, so that's this trajectory that I've shown a few times now uh, was designed using a combination of targeting an unstable mean motion resonance that is also kind of naturally connected to ballistic capture. So this, I think this is the 5-2 resonance. Then it gets near L1 and then it gets onto a, an orbit around the moon. So where yeah. in that part is the initial delta V? Uh, it would be it would, here, the initial delta V just, just, just gets you out of geo. Yeah. This is showing kind of one of the th interesting things about these low energy trajectories is they have this uh, fuel and time trade-off. So if you wanted to do a Hohmann transfer from that, from that same orbit I, I showed to a, that final lunar orbit, uh, you could use a Hohmann transfer. The time of flight's only about a week, but the delta V is uh, about 1,200 meters per second. Some other work by some mathematicians found things that kind of near a minimum delta V, but they, they took a very long time. This is in days. All right, so one year, two years. But there, there is actually some kind of Pareto optimal front. So the work that we've done has sort of been trying to fill out what that trade-off is. So if you want to get there within two months, you know, there's some trajectory that gets there within two months, and it only costs around 900 meters per second. 
Now, a question that gets asked sometimes, and I'm going to end here, is what about more realistic models? Well, the circular restricted three-body problem, two main perturbations of it are to include the sun, that's called the bicircular problem, or to include the moon's eccentricity, so that's the elliptic restricted three-body problem. And really, all of the phenomena that we've talked about will carry over to those systems, which means it's a good approximation and should even show up in the rule ephemeris. So if you think of a hierarchy of models, we've got our circular problem, maybe the bicircular or elliptic problem, maybe some stages of more accurate models, and then the real ephemeris. So here is, I think this is the capstone nearly rectilinear halo orbit in the simplest model. So of course, it closes back on, on itself. That's nice. If you look in, include the effect of the sun and the moon's ellipticity, you get something that doesn't exactly close back on itself, but it's similar. It might be well approximated by this. If we now go to the real ephemeris, um, it, it looks more like this kind of bicircular and elliptic problem than it does um, anything else. And there's, again, you could use tools of differential correction to find these things. Now, I did say something about in the circular problem, you have these equilibrium points. But then when you go to other models, like perturbation due to the sun or ellipticity, the, the Lagrange point gets replaced by some uh, periodic orbit, which is like the dynamical equivalent of the Lagrange point. And really, all of the phenomena we've talked about carry over. So if you want to know more, and this is the last slide, uh, I've got a book that's available um, for free, just PDF. I even have a, a lecture series where I go into this in more depth. It's about 15 hours. Um, you can, it's on YouTube, but this is sort of a shortcut to it. And uh, I do post a lot of material on uh, YouTube and Twitter. So you can follow us. And we want to thank the support of the, the University Space Research Association for this, uh, the new XGO project. So that's it. If you appreciated this video, please like and subscribe, or just wait and watch the next video in the series.